go. Hello, hello. Making all the connections here. Great to see you. Hello to YouTube. And hello to Facebook. <laughs> well, hello to the people on YouTube and Facebook. <clears throat> and thanks for joining me for day three of the Violympic trials. Great to see you. And we've got some more fun assignments today, some more uh, scordatura. Actually, uh, I left my, my violin tuned down, the G-string tuned down overnight. So maybe it'll even behave that much better since it's used to the, the new tuning. But wonderful to see you. As always, hump day for the Violympic Trials, day, day three of five. Um, great, just keeping an eye on the connection here. Um, so, you know, midweek, we're going to keep, we've got plenty of assignments to keep building some new skills and, of course, revisiting old ones, perhaps doing them in new ways. And we're also going to start turning our attention toward the end of the week because, of course, this uh, it wouldn't be practice makes performance if there weren't some sort of performance at the end. And this, of course, is a condensed schedule. This is not the way I typically learn every new piece. But it's a fun late spring, early summer challenge, right, to take something short, and to prove to yourself that you can put it together in a very short time frame. Now, what do you lose when you do that? Well, some comfort, of course. Um, I don't know any top soloists who would choose to learn something new and present it to the public in just a few days or in a week, right? I mean, they're typically, even the, <clears throat> the most famous and amazing and talented violinists and violists that you see on the, the world stages, you know, they're going to learn a piece and then relearn it and relearn it and present it to a small group and then another small group and test it out. And only then, right, are they going to put it before the public. So when you do things on this condensed time frame, it can be really fun, but you have to manage your expectations, right? I don't expect for myself that everything is going to come off exactly the way I want in every performance. You know, I learned this piece. Now, I, I, I said this the first day, too, and some of you thought it was funny, but it's true. Just because I wrote the piece doesn't mean that I can automatically immediately perform it, right? Um, and I only gave myself a few days to, to practice it and to make a recording, but was take one the take to use? Not really, <laughs> you know, that was the first performance. And so there were things that didn't quite come off the way I wanted and gave myself a few tries. And so you should certainly expect that as you add new skills, as you change the way you do things, that they will season over time, right? Some of them will show up right away in the fast rows of summer and in your recording and others, my great hope, Others, you will notice finding their way into your playing throughout the rest of the summer, of course, particularly if you're going to be part of the full Violympic Games. There's going to be plenty more, plenty more new stuff, new skills, and a lot more seasoning going on. So that's the point of all this. And the next two days, four and five, are really the ones where you're going to Put together your best version of the fast rows. So let's keep uh, let's keep building skills here. Wanted to 
rise up on me a, a little overnight. Just a reminder, whether you're on Facebook and YouTube, if you haven't registered yet for these Violympic trials, then that means you probably don't have the music to the Fast Rose of Summer or any of the other helpful info, your welcome packet, your journal, your assignments. If you haven't registered yet, take a moment, look at that link in the description. Just do that and you should find everything you need in your email. So, day three, the assignments, we're going to start with bow shapes. And this really builds on what we did with the three variables, okay? The three variables that control sound on any string instrument, the, well, the three main bow variables, bow speed, bow pressure, contact point. You get control of those, then you can make any sound you want. And whether you know it or not, any time you have made a crescendo or diminuendo in the past, you've been manipulating those variables somehow. The problem is that we tend to get used to certain patterns, right? If I'm playing and I want to play it louder, probably the first thing I'm going to do, at least the first thing I did years ago, is just to press harder, right? And that can work okay. What I subconsciously did as well was to speed up the bow a little bit. But I didn't really change anything about the contact point. I started here, medium dynamic, and I pressed harder and moved the bow faster to play louder. So what you might notice is that there's a little bit of a, a hardness a little bit of a pressed quality to that sound. It was louder. But what if I changed contact point instead? So starting here, if I move to a two, that's got some more volume, right? And without the, without that kind of nasally pressed quality subjective when we talk about sound quality. Let's look at bars 8 to 11 in the fast rows and each bar is going to have a diminuendo, right? So to prep for that I want you to play your two middle open strings as a double stop, right? Except you're going to start with a fast bow and slow the bow down as you go, okay? You can use whatever contact point feels comfortable but the idea is, so starting with a fast bow and slowing. And what a nice, beautiful, and natural diminuendo that makes. Do the same on an up bow. For some people, it's a lot more natural to do it on a down bow than an up bow, but you need to be able to do it in both directions if you want to play bow after bow with dims, right? So let's put that into bars 8 through 11 in the piece. We'll forget about the pizzicato for now. That's a rather bold diminuendo, which is to say a rather bold start to the bar. If we'd like it to be a little more subtle, then we can use less bow overall, but still to start with a faster bow and to slow it as we go. So maybe instead of the whole bow, maybe I'll use the middle part. If you start fast and slow down right away, that's basically an accent, right? If you slow down very gradually, then that's a smoother dim. It's all up to you how you want to do the proportions there. Oop. 12 to 15 you're going to play your second to lowest string. So D for violin, G for viola. And now the down bows are going to crescendo 
which means that you start slow and go to fast. The up bows are going to dim, just like we were doing before. So we've got slow, fast, fast, slow. And that sounds complicated to say it, but all it is, right, is a hairpin. Crescendo and diminuendo. And you can put that right into bars 12 to 15. One helpful way that you can gauge this, because a lot of times you may think you're doing a certain shape or distribution with the bow, but when it, comes to, when it comes down to it, you haven't changed much. If I truly am going to be speeding up the bow as I go, starting with the slow bow, then I might want to play two beats with the first half of the bow, and use the second half of the bow just for the third beat of the bar. Right, because if I'm just dividing it into thirds, then that means I've just got one bow speed for the whole bow, right? That would be one bow speed. Instead, one, two, three, I've used the second half of the bow for the third third of the bar. So. And that's how I can get those hairpins. Looking more at bow shapes, 16 to 19. Again, I have you start with an open string so that we're not fooling with fingers yet. <clears throat> so the same open string. And what this is about, it's not a shape within each bar. It's a shape over several bars, right? So now for each bow, I want to use more and more. So I'm going to start with not so much. Maybe I also change contact points. You can do that if it feels natural to you. But mostly it's about amount of bow. So if I put fingers to that. How about pressure? You know, that's, that's really the last variable I would, I would worry about. You're going to adjust pressure, adjust pressure naturally, more than likely. Um, and you'll hear it if you don't. The problem is that most of us think pressure first. I'd love for you to think pressure last. Do what you can with amount of bow. Look next at what contact point you're at to inform your quality of sound. And finally, let your, let your hand, let your arm adjust the pressure as you need to keep a pure sound. So, the last challenge with the bow shapes comes in bars 68 to 69, <laughs> exaggerating those shapes. Um, I threw that in there uh, for any of you who have played Ravel's La Valse. Of course, so much of this is uh, ripped from Ravel La Valse, including uh, that comes from there. there uh, a few very difficult bars in that piece that have this dynamic structure. The so that's all about bow distribution, amount of bow. If you can pull that off, then you're ready to play Ravel's La Valse. Um, well, let's go to the next assignment, which is new finger slides. And if you want much more background on this, I made a video called Never Miss a Violin Shift Again. Um, you know, I've been called out <laughs> since making that video. Um, have you really never missed a shift since you made that video? Yeah, I have, but it's only because I didn't do what I said in that video. Uh, the basic idea is that if you listen for your slides on the way up when you practice, then there's no reason you need to go past your destination note. And there's no reason you need to stop short. You just keep sliding till you get there. Um, it sounds simple, and actually, in a, in a way, it really is. 
So let's take the, I, I, I would love for you to see that video if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it's got some cool golfing backgrounds there, some early green screen attempts by me. Uh, let's look at 36 to 37, and we'll also look at 44 to 45. We've got this slide here. So, how do I ensure that I never miss that again? Um, it's a slide, if you're following my fingerings, from one to three. It's a new finger slide, as opposed to, we could also slide with the old finger and drop the three. But, for this character, I want something really gutsy. I'm going to slide with the new finger on the new bow, right? So, when I'm practicing this, I'm going to be listening all the way up. And I don't like hearing a ding. Um, however long it takes. And one of the secrets to performing this kind of slide effectively is that the fastest, I should say the slowest part, is right at the end. Um, and one of my favorite images for this comes, well, from Dorothy DeLay as related by Simon Fisher. Uh, Dorothy DeLay was waiting for her car in a parking structure in New York, and you know how those uh, parking attendants they know the structure, they, they can drive seemingly like maniacs, and that's what was happening. Her car was barreling towards her, and then at the very last moment, came to a smooth stop, and she thought, ah, that's how a long slide should be. You zoom most of it. The last part is the slowest part. You just ease in there, and in practicing, you do just what I did. Take your time, get used to zooming, Again, you're just as we did with same finger slides, not above the string or with the ghost finger. You're connected. The last part, as you feel your finger easing into its place, the vibrato is there, the full contact is there. Then all you have to do, look what you've uh, achieved, by the way. You're practicing and always playing this slide in tune. Did you ever think you'd play? long slides 100% in tune. All you've got to do now is change the timing of it. Your ear will get faster the more you practice this. Until you really feel like you can't miss. It's an extraordinary thing. Um, it's the same process from 44 to 45. Of course, that is from a first to fourth finger, but Nothing else needs to change. Now, what did I do there? I slid too fast for my ear. I wasn't really listening on my way up. So in practice, what I'm learning to identify when I do this, by the way, what I'm learning to identify is the sound or the pitch right before I arrive. Because if I can train my ear to identify that, even if there are other things going on, then I'll always know when I need to stop sliding. All right. That is worth really repeating. And to be honest, it's fun to repeat that because it's fun to play long slides in tune. Um, when you do it with double stops, I just wanted to note that for a moment your bow is on a single string and that's when the slide happens. All right. Fingers a step ahead is the next assignment. Looking at bars 20 and 28. And what you want to do is to start building the feeling that your fingers are moving in advance. Um, it is rare actually, that you need to drop a finger at exactly the precise moment that the note comes out. Think about that. 
what's the only time that you must drop or lift a finger exactly when you want your audience to hear it? It's only during an ascending slur for dropping fingers. Right? Or during really connected legato bows. And for lifting fingers, same deal. It's only during a descending slur or descending connected legato bows on the same string. In all other cases, you can get those fingers there in advance. For example, with string crossings, anytime you're playing off the string, anytime you're making an entrance. So as soon as you play the next to last note of these bars 20 and 28, you want to feel your first finger move onto the next string. We're also going to look at bar 51. But first, 20 and 28. So we've got... So to begin with, when I start that bar with the fourth finger, I'd like my three and two resting in their places behind four. So when I start, there they are resting in their places. And as soon as my two is played, I want my one over on the next string down in its place. And that's how that crossing gets smooth. A lot of people here, they have a bad string crossing and they think, oh, I, I didn't do it smoothly. Sometimes it's just because they were putting their finger down at the same time. Okay, so it's the same deal with 28. Right. In fact, in this instance, if you're following my fingering, your one was already in its place, so just don't move it. All right. Bar 51. If you're using my fingering, you don't want to be... Moving your fingers for each thing? No. Finger that double stop. Finger this double stop. Makes that much easier to play. You can take this a step further, of course, <laughs> and you'll need to for the rose, the famous rose. And what you want to do is slur pairs of notes so that you can give yourself plenty of time to discover which fingers you can prepare in advance. Um, you want to try in both bowing directions, but let me give you a taste of what that is. So you're going to repeat a note easier to just do than to explain, but... So I'm slurring two notes, but I'm keeping the second note. And any time I can prepare a finger, I'm going to do it. So far, got it. I've got my one behind my two, dropping my three with my four, getting my one over, getting my two over, two covering the next string as well, preparing the one. getting the four over. All right. The faster I can do that, the more successfully I can actually play those notes smoothly. This is a really powerful technique and all the best work gets done slowly when you can feel those fingers moving in advance because what you're doing is building the proper slow motion version of your fast performance. This is the big downfall of slow practice for so many people. They think, okay, I've done it slowly and carefully, every note's in its place. But then when they go to play fast, 
suddenly it doesn't want to work anymore. And that's because what they built was not a slow motion version of a fast performance. They built a slow, blocky performance. Sprints. And this really applies to the end, that last scale, if you're going to go all the way up the scale. The idea is that to play a scale quickly or any note, any run of notes quickly, you don't need to be dropping four fingers. One, two, three, four. Maybe you do in a way, but it all depends on how you think about it. What if you dropped your whole hand with the fingers in the right spacing? It's just that in the end, I won't drop them all at once. Right, I'm gonna kind of rock my hand instead of that. But does that look like I'm dropping four fingers? No. Same for lifting, by the way. I'm almost lifting them all at once. So. Combine that with a couple string crossings, you've got a scale. So let's take a look at that last scale. What are we doing on the lowest string? Well, I'm dropping four fingers, but let me get the spacing. Okay, I'm going to lift them. What's the next string? Okay. I'm only using one, two, and three on this string. I'm only using two fingers on the next string. Once I shift, and etc. You do it string by string and shift by shift. Every move you make you drop as many fingers as you can at once. So now I was pausing at the beginning and at the end of each pattern. I could also Like that. The more things I can chain together, the closer I get to a fast and easy performance, but it all starts with recognizing what those drops are. So all right. That if you've never done that before, that is instantly going to make your scales easier, better in tune, and faster. And sprints are not just for giant scales, it's for, you know, any little grouping of notes. Score to Tura Follies, I don't have to demonstrate too much. This is really an assignment for you. It's a little bit of homework. It's just to make sure that you have got things marked in your music that are going to help you figure out the score to Tura. So, you know, if you like using the original part that has the notes as they sound, that's fine. You know, when it came time for me to record this to perform it, I had arrows in places where I realized, uh, you know what, I see that three and my three always wants to go low. Uh, so I put an up arrow. Maybe you need reminder fingerings. Maybe you want to use the parts that are written as the notes are fingered. But whatever it is, you want to go over every time that you cross to your lowest string, every time that you cross back from your lowest string. Those are the moments that are sort of mind bending. So, you know, you can also think in terms of double stops, right? Um, at times you're going to finger something that's like a perfect fourth. But if you're doing it between your two lowest strings, it's going to sound as, that didn't sound like a perfect fifth, but it should. So 
that can help in some cases. That's Scordatura Follies. Take a look at chords and how to play those successfully easily. The general strategy for three note chords. Now we talked about two note chords or double stops the other day and how it's such a nice feeling to have your bow riding on rails and how you can actually identify that feeling get a sense of when your bow is well supported by two strings and then that can be a powerful image that your bow is supported from beneath rather than you having to press it down into the strings when you're playing more than two strings so a three note chord or a four note chord generally what you want to do is start with the bottom two strings and with the top two strings right so for three notes the middle string is the one in common so and isn't that just rocking on that pivot string it's not a big roll or a jerky nah The quicker that rock is, the transition, the more it can sound like you're playing three notes at once. So in the Ravel La Valse part of the top of the second page, for example, it's the same chord as the first chord of the chaconne, isn't it? That would be a challenge, wouldn't it? Play the chaconne with a G string tuned down. Ooh, that's a reach. Um, so the quicker that is, the more it sounds like you're playing three notes at once. For four notes, for example, the first chord of the piece. Right? Two and two. So you're rocking over rails. Not a point, but... The biggest mental hurdle to get past with that is a rush to get to the top strings. We're so conditioned as violinists, sometimes as violists, to think of melody. So we see that chord and we think we've got to get to the wank to the top. Start with those low two strings on the beat. That's the bass, literally the bass of the chord. Get used to doing that and then keep your bow on the string and rock it. No one says you can't do it fast, but you have to have those bottom strings sounding. All right. So the way to build that, if you play your second to lowest string, I want you to get the feel now, not just for a double stop, but for a three note chord. I suggest you play about a contact point of four for this. Okay, so it's where the string is a little springier. You're going to start out decently fast bow, not too much pressure. Out there you may find it tough to stay on one string, and that's a good thing, because you're going to add pressure and a little bit of speed. Resist the temptation to start rocking the bow. You're going to keep it right on that string in the violin. It's the D string, viola will be the G string. As you add speed and pressure, you're going to hear those surrounding strings start to sound. Okay. That's the way you can play a three note chord at once. Beginning of the chaconne, for example, if I really wanted to do that, I'm going to start my arm not on this double stop level or this one. I'm going to start it right on the middle string level and just use that same stroke that we just had. Now, because that bow is moving fast, there's no way I could sustain that for the whole bow. So what do I do? I start the chord like that and then gently rock it over to the top two strings to hold those. And that next chord, I'm not going to try to play squirted to her. Good. Um, in your assignment, you'll see that you can also practice starting on the three lowest strings, rocking to the three highest.
Some people prefer to think of a four note chord in that fashion, three to three. More people like to think of it two and two. If it's done well, those two versions don't have to sound all that different from each other. It's just what feels more comfortable to you. And our last assignment for today, reaching out of the frame. By that I mean hand frame. A stable hand frame means that your hand is not moving around. It's the fingers that are changing their places and positions. And when you've got that nice frame, sometimes you need to reach out of it temporarily. So we're going to look at bars 80 and 83. And the fact that you can play each of those bars without moving your hand. Now to test that, I'm going to be looking at the back of my hand really to see if that's, if this shape is changing, this angle of the wrist, I don't really want to see that changing. And I also don't want to see my hand moving up or down the neck of the violin. I want to stay in one position and just have fingers reach up or back. So one crept up there, but you notice the hand doesn't change. Two is sliding, but the hand doesn't change. One reaches back and back up. Okay. If I, for example, move the hand up for that and thought, ooh, second position. Now I've got to shift back down, shift down for this and back up as possible. But look all that that I have to do with my hand. I used to play that way <laughs> and I used to play less well in tune because every adjustment you make with the hand, you've got to make the equivalent adjustment coming back. How much easier and more consistent it is. Bar 83. This time we're starting in what we might call fourth position. This bar as well, I don't have to move the hand. Start to identify those parts. Sometimes it won't be an entire bar. Those happen to be two bars where the whole bar you can play without moving the hand. But start looking for those little units. Maybe it's four notes, maybe it's six or eight notes, where previously you were moving things around and then you discover, you know what, the finger could do that job and my hand could stay stable. So those are the, the best examples. Um, if we look at 74 and 75, those are places where it's advantageous to reach the finger first and then let the hand follow. You can start getting in trouble when you combine those two things and do them at once. So let's look at 74 and 75. Right. That's a place where I've got to reach the one back because of the score to Tura stuff, but I don't want to kind of reach and shift at the same time. I want to reach first and get the string crossing taken care of and then let my hand follow back down because I need to get into second position. So that's not the right note. So it's a reach then a shift. And now I've forgotten the, the other bar that I just told you about where that happens. Well, it's the very next bar. 75. I'm reaching down with the two, but I do need my hand then to follow back because I'm going to stay in first position. All right. In 87, That's another reach 
and go back with the one. And it's followed by an old finger slide that we talked about the very first day. So to start identifying the difference between a reach and a follow, as opposed to a true slide or shift. Reach and follow. Slide. So, those are your assignments. Day three. In the next two days, there will be fewer and fewer new skills, new assignments. We'll be zeroing in, and I'll be asking you to zero in on your final version of the piece. You can keep getting a sense for that now. Where do you feel yourself heading tempo-wise? I'd rather have you go conservative in the tempo and put in tons of character and perhaps leave a little room for a cello rondo at the end. Um, skills are always easiest to assimilate when you give yourself more space. That means slower tempo. Um, but I don't want to stand in your way. If you really want this to be the fast rose of summer, let a few notes drop. Who cares? I'm the I give you permission. I'm the composer. So um, we'll talk more about strategies um, to come up with tempo and to decide on your performance version in the next two days. So I really thank you for being here with me again. Best of luck, enjoy, and hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye.